Next on Unsolved Mysteries. Four people are murdered in two different states. The suspects are two teenage boys. Three men move into a Texas ranch only to find out it's still inhabited by a group of hell-raising poltergeists. A disheveled man stumbles out of the desert. He has no money, no ID, and he has no idea who he is or where he is. A father of three vanishes. His family suspects he was kidnapped. Some say he disappeared on purpose. Our team continues to track crimes, wanted fugitives, and tales of the paranormal. Perhaps you can help. I'm Dennis Farina, and this is Unsolved Mysteries. Gainesville, Texas, a small town near the Oklahoma border. On a spring morning, 23-year-old Dina Woodard and her one-year-old son, Corey, returned home. stabbed and nearly decapitated with an ax. Her baby was spared. Dina's attacker stole her two guns and took her car. As shocking as it was, Dina Woodard's murder was just the beginning of a 24-hour thrill-kill crime spree that covered three states and left four people dead. The killers were two teenage boys. Using Dina Woodard's car, the killers drove 75 miles southeast to the small rural community of Farmersville, Texas. When you have a situation start developing like this where the first victim is killed, then it's panic time. They run to get away, and then it doesn't get any better. The more involved they become, the more killings take place. In Farmersville, the killers approached the home of 85-year-old Cecil Morrison and his 62-year-old son, Cecil Leonard Morrison. Howdy. Uh, howdy. Uh, could I use your telephone? What, what for? Uh, my car broke down. Your car broke down? Enough! The teenagers savagely tortured and beat the two men, and then shot them both with a 22 caliber rifle. It was not just a quick murder. Now, why they felt necessary to beat the old man and torture him like they did, we do not know. A neighbor saw two teenagers getting into the Morrison's pickup truck. Dina Woodard's car was also gone. Four hours later, in Saratoga, Arkansas, the boys drove the stolen pickup truck into a lake and then tossed in Dina Woodard's guns. Later that night, the young killers walked up to the trailer of their fourth victim, 29-year-old Kenneth Olden. He was with his girlfriend, Brenda Gibson. May I help you? Uh, yeah. My truck broke down. Do you think you could give us a hand? Kenny didn't think they was dangerous. He thought they was really sincere, else he would have never attempted to help them. And when they went out through the kitchen door, I looked out the window. And that was the last I saw of him, alive. The killers drove away with Kenneth Holden in his Mustang. Their destination, Millwood Dam, five miles away. The truck should be right over there. 
I think the cables are in the back. Okay, I'll go ahead and get them. Hey, man. Ain't no truck around here. The teenagers made their getaway in Kenneth Olin's Mustang. 9 a.m. the next day, 230 miles west of where Kenneth Olin was killed, a farmer came across Olin's abandoned Mustang. In less than 24 hours, the killers had come full circle. They started in Gainesville, Texas. Going southeast to Farmersville, they then went northeast to Saratoga, Arkansas, and then they finally turned west and went to Brown Springs, Oklahoma, less than five miles from where their killing spree started. The big question is why would they have returned to within five miles of where they committed the first murder? We felt like we were dealing with something here in our own neighborhood. Investigators lifted several fingerprints from Olden's car, but weren't sure if they belonged to the killers. The police were also eager to find Dina Woodard's missing Thunderbird. We feel like that if we could find that automobile, or find someone with knowledge of where the automobile might be. That might be the clue that solves this case. Four months into the investigation, a new clue turned up. Cecil Morrison's grandson found an earring that the killers might have left behind in his grandfather's pickup truck. This earring depicted a skull being carried by a bat, and that was another key break in this case. We later ran a photograph of that earring in the Gainesville local paper. And a young man came forward and identified that earring as belonging to him. Where did you get the earring? A girl gave it to me a couple of years ago. Do you still have the earring? No, sir, I don't. What's happened to it? I lent it to a friend of mine a couple of months ago. The boy, Lee Renfro, told police he had given the earring to another boy, John Caldwell. At the time, Caldwell lived less than 200 yards from Dina Woodard. But John's family had moved out of the state a month before Dina was murdered. Lee had given me a lot of earrings, and I would borrow or take some from him every once in a while, like whenever I didn't have one. But as far as that earring in particular, I have no idea. I just can't remember. On the morning of the murder spree, witnesses had seen two teenage boys who matched the description of the killers walking away from the Caldwell house. This earring was once owned by Lee Renfro. He gave it to John Caldwell. Perhaps taken by one of the young killers, it turned up in the pickup truck they stole from Cecil Morrison. Authorities believed that it could help them solve the case. This case has got to be solved. As long as it goes unsolved, there's still that concern that there's still some killers out there walking the streets. And who's to say when they might decide to strike again and go on another crime spree? Update. We have good news on this case. Two men from Gainesville, Texas, have been identified as the killers. 19-year-old William Glenn Henry was arrested after investigators matched his fingerprints with those found in Kenny Olden's abandoned car. Nine days later, Henry's accomplice, 20-year-old Davy Lynn Crockett, was arrested after he confessed to his involvement in the murders. Later, Crockett took investigators to a small lake near Cecil Morrison's home. There they found Dina Woodard's car, buried beneath several feet of mud and silt. William Glenn Henry pleaded guilty to three counts of first-degree murder and was sentenced to three 99-year terms. Davy Lynn Crockett was sentenced to four 99-year terms. Coming up, a man stumbles out of the desert with no idea who he is. On the outskirts of Las Vegas, Nevada, a young man was found wandering aimlessly through the desert. He was dressed in three layers of clothing, carried no identification, and had apparently been in the desert for at least three days. You okay? You okay? Water. What happened? Okay. He was rushed to a hospital, suffering from exposure and extreme dehydration. The patient was diagnosed with psychogenic amnesia, 
a condition caused not by physical injury, but by some kind of traumatic experience. While he recovered, the hospital staff named the man Tyler. Authorities in Las Vegas could find no missing person who matched Tyler's description. There was no record of his fingerprints with the FBI or the CIA. But doctors did find two clues. Evidence of hairline fractures in the knuckles of both hands and what is believed to be an old gunshot wound on his right thigh. Otherwise, it's as if Tyler never existed. During a conversation with a fellow patient who was from San Diego, California, Tyler got the eerie feeling that he had once lived there, but the memories lacked detail until he was hypnotized. I started remembering a lot about the beaches and different things around the beaches. I also remembered a lot about the military bases in San Diego. There's the Coast Guard, airfield right across from Lindbergh Field, uh, actually more like a hangar. I just really got a sense of belonging, like San Diego was the place that I needed to be. Under hypnosis, Tyler also vividly recalled flying over San Diego. He was certain that he knew how to pilot an airplane. Tyler felt that getting behind the controls of a plane might help trigger additional memories. Accompanied by a flight instructor, he put his uncanny knowledge of flying to the test. Okay, let's try another turn, all right? Try to keep that nose level. Go ahead and watch your altimeter, just make sure it stays about the same all the way through. Finally, complete control of the plane was given to Tyler, and he brought it in for a landing. There we go, not bad. The instructor felt that although rusty, Tyler had definitely flown before. And as time passed, there were more intriguing clues. Although Tyler could not remember his own name, he could dismantle and rebuild a race car engine. He also had detailed knowledge of the bombing mechanism in the Navy's A-6 attack plane. But why? Many of these clues suggest that Tyler has some kind of military background. But no record of this man has been found in the Navy or any other branch of the service. I'm really kind of at a difficult point in my life right now where I can't move ahead with myself. I can't get on with my life. I can't do anything, really. I'm almost like an illegal alien here. I, I have no identification of any, of any form now. I can't go to work because I, I'm not eligible for a social security number. I can't drive a car. And I'm starting to feel more frustrated as the days go by because I really feel this needs to come to an end. I do need to find out who I am. When this segment first aired, one of our camera crews joined Tyler and some of his friends in Las Vegas. Update. Within minutes of the broadcast, a man called us here at Unsolved Mysteries and said that he was Tyler's father. Well, we quickly contacted Tyler and he began to fill in the missing pieces of his past. Yes, sir. Sorry uh, it took so long, but everything that, that I was looking to cross-referenced and we have located your family for you. You have? Yes. I have located your dad and your mother and your wife, who you've been separated from for, since February of 1990. Um, they've informed me that you also have two children. And your wife lives in Iowa, your mother lives in Iowa, and your dad lives in Idaho, OK? So I want to give you some phone numbers here. So you Tyler learned that his real name was Arthur Paul Beal, but he went by Paul. He was 23 years old, and before he got amnesia, he lived in Boise, Idaho. A few minutes later, a nervous Paul Beal called his mother, a person he could not even remember. Hello? May I speak with Mrs. Beal? This is Mrs. Beal. This is your son. How are you? You sound great. I've waited so long to hear you talk. You. I'm scared. I bet you are. I don't oh. remember you. Huh? The emotional phone call lasted close to 20 minutes. I'll help you. You be strong, okay? And I'll talk to you real soon. Okay. Okay, honey. Bye. 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 <sighs> 
Their reunion was both emotional <laughs> and awkward. Paul still had no recognition of his own mother. <laughs> I don't remember you. He will. It's strange being with Paul and his not remembering anything about me, not knowing who I am. I just I want to push everything into his head, make him remember everything. I want to reinforce happy thoughts, good memories. No, I just want him to know I love him. We all love him. Even looking at family photos didn't jog Paul's memory. This is probably the most horrifying nightmare that anybody could go through, losing an identity, losing every ounce and fiber of a person's life. And then nine months later, have it given back to you or have it presented to you, but you still don't, don't have it. And I give anything in the world to remember right now. Next, allegations of murder and a cover-up inside one of America's largest prisons for women. Frontera Prison in California is one of the largest penitentiaries in America for women. Its maximum security wing houses some of the state's most dangerous female offenders. But it is the alleged criminal activities of some guards and administrators that have drawn the most attention. It began with the mysterious disappearance of Frontera guard Jesslyn Rich. Some former prison employees believe that Jesslyn was silenced because of what she knew about a prison drug ring run by other guards. Jesslyn Rich was a 35-year-old divorced mother of two. While working at Frontera, she had maintained a straight A average in criminology courses at night. At the time of her disappearance, Jesslyn had reportedly grown concerned about drug dealing inside the prison walls. You wanna dance? Jesslyn was last seen at a country western bar. She and a friend, Marilyn Alt, were joined by two male acquaintances. And work and school. <laughs> See, that's your problem. You, you gotta get out more and live life. That's what it's all about there. And all of a sudden, she sits very still and looks almost past me to the front door. Jessica? And I look okay? at her, and her eyes drew wide and uh, fearful looking. But I didn't look to the door. I just, for some reason, just didn't turn around. I'll be right back. I'll use the ladies for him. As she uh, turns around the corner to go down the hallway to the bathroom, a gentleman appears to me out of the side of my eye, going directly behind her. And that's the last I see her, ever. Jessalyn Rich literally vanished without a trace. Her family and friends launched an all-out search. To them, it seemed out of character for Jessalyn to abandon her children and to scrap her career aspirations. Her family believes that she was kidnapped and possibly murdered. But police say they had no evidence to support that theory. They made light of it, called us just distraught relatives, suggested that my sister had just ran off on a fling with some person, which is totally absurd. It just was unheard of. Gary tore apart his sister's house, searching for clues. When he sifted through Jessalyn's trash, he found evidence that her knowledge of illegal activities at the prison put her life in danger. And inside, in the plastic bag, where there were many, many pieces of paper torn up, very, very small. I picked up a few of these, and I could tell that it was my sister's writing or printing. And they were uh, apparently notes or letters to a friend of hers, a co-worker and I figured that I would take them home and sort them out later. The letter had been written to another guard at Frontier. Scrawled on the margin of the last page was Jesslyn's haunting recital of an apparent threat she had received from the coworker, that anyone interfering with drug activities would be taken care of. At the time, this letter was the only concrete evidence indicating that Jesslyn had met with foul play. The case went cold. Three years later, an inmate named Terry Lucas told the guard that she had information about Jesslyn Rich. 
She said that she was being threatened by other guards to keep quiet. And she tells me that she's got information. She knows who was involved in the disappearance of Jesslyn Rich. I can give you all the evidence you need. The next morning, Betty Thompson went to see Terry in the prison infirmary where she was recovering from a cancer biopsy. When I walked over to touch her, I noticed that Terry was dead. I went out of the cell, and I went down to the nurse's station, and I told them what, what I had seen, um, the coldness of the room, that she was not covered, her breakfast tray had not been touched, and the nurses told me they would take care of it. Betty said that Terry's body stayed in the cell for a full three days before the county coroner's office was called. According to Thompson, an official from the coroner's office was mystified by what he found. Betty says there were blades of grass in Lucas's hair and multiple bruises on her face, ears, neck, and lower arms. Her right arm appeared to be broken. He is saying that he sees evidence that she was suffocated with the pillow that had been under her arm that appeared to be broken. Betty Thompson said that after the official met prison administrators in Lucas's cell, he had a sudden change of heart. And he told me that we were not going to call it murder, and we were not going to say that she was laying there dead for three days. We were going to, in fact, say that she was actually laying there only two hours, and that the cause of death was actually um, complications due to diabetes. Thompson says that one of her superiors demanded that she change her report on Terry Lucas's death. According to Thompson, she was subjected to threats and intimidations for six hours. There was one high administrator that even made the comment that the same thing that happened to Jesslyn Rich could easily happen to me. At that point in time, I broke down and cried. I hadn't told anything what Terry Lucas had said. And for him to bring up Jesslyn Rich and her disappearance, it said why Terry Lucas had died. It had definitely had something to do with that. Thompson says she finally gave in and signed a false report that had been typed for her. But I added on the bottom that I had signed the document under duress and the document was untrue. To my knowledge, that document was ripped up. Another one was retyped saying the similar things that were on the first document and that my, my signature was forged. Betty Thompson claims that later she received a threatening phone call. Infirmary Officer Thompson. Thompson, if you don't learn to do things in the proper manner, you'll end up dead alongside some muddy ditch. The following day, Thompson had a scary encounter. Have you been receiving threatening phone calls? What are you talking about? Oh, like you might be found dead in a ditch one night? The hair on the back of my neck just stood straight up. I was absolutely petrified because I knew that she knew what they were saying to me and that she was part of whoever was threatening me. Thompson says the menacing calls continued for seven months. Then, Betty immediately called the police, who arrived at her home moments later. As I was upstairs filing a police report about this, the shooting, a phone call came in, and I picked up the phone. It was a male voice, and he said, next time we won't miss. Eventually, the scandal was the subject of several front page articles that appeared in the Orange County Register. These articles supported insider accounts of drug dealing and corruption. That year, Betty Thompson and five other guards testified before state senate hearings on the alleged offenses at Frontier Prison. Officials at Frontier declined to be interviewed for this story. However, a spokesman for the California Department of Corrections told us, quote, I'm not saying the things people are alleging didn't happen. There's just no evidence to support them, unquote. Next, a remote Texas ranch where the owners claim that some boisterous demons are driving them out of their minds. Previously, we brought you the story of Michael Swango, a medical doctor 
wanted for murder. As a medical student, Michael Swangel used his hospital internship to secretly kill. When mysterious deaths happened on his watch, hospital officials got suspicious. And when co-workers became ill, they thought Swangel was poisoning them. Swangel represents the ultimate betrayal. We trust doctors. We put our lives and health in their hands. And Swangel held himself out as someone who was willing to help, but in fact, he was looking to hurt. Using various aliases, Michael Swangel spent years on the run. When police began to close in, he fled to Zimbabwe, Africa. Soon after, authorities issued a warrant for Swangel's arrest for the only thing they could, fraud. He had lied on a federal job application. Update. Michael Swango has been captured. He was running from Africa to Saudi Arabia, but had to stop in the US to renew his visa. At O'Hara Airport in Chicago, a customs agent ran his name through the computer, found the warrant, and he was arrested. Nothing compares to Swango. The unbelievable, strange motives that he had and the length of time for which he did it, and the number of times he got away with it, I mean, nothing compares. While serving time on the fraud charge, federal prosecutors worked up a murder case against Swango that could put him away for life. We had to prove that there was a homicide. Normally, that's not a problem in a murder case. You have a dead body, there's a bullet, there's a stabbing, there's a strangling, a beating. In this case, the people had, been, had passed on, and it had been assumed that they died naturally. In the end, exhumed bodies, toxicology tests, an eyewitness, and even Swangle's own diaries helped prosecutors build an airtight case. We can tell from Michael Swangle's writings that he simply liked to kill people. For him, the thrill was doing the killing and getting away with it. And that's why it was difficult to establish a pattern with him, because he was something of an opportunistic killer. He would kill whenever he had the chance to kill. Michael Swango pled guilty to four counts of murder. But it's impossible to know just how many people he has actually killed. Swango was sent to our nation's highest security federal prison in Colorado. He is serving three life terms without the possibility of parole. Everybody loves a good ghost story, and the three Texas cowboys you're about to meet have a great one. Their ghost won't be satisfied until it has scared the life out of everyone. In Texas Hill Country, three ranchers took over a 3,000 acre spread with plans to turn it into a hunting reserve. Wow, it looks a little furniture. furniture. While fixing up the place, the partners lived in the main building, a four bedroom house built in the 1950s. <laughs> From the very first night, the men discovered that they had some company. It sounded as if when it started, it was like off in a distance, and each time he would make a step, you could hear the individual steps that he would make. In my mind, you know, I, I didn't want to consider the fact it might be a ghost or something of that nature. Almost every night, there was something new. Crashing footsteps, thunderous blows on the walls or ceilings. The men say they never saw a ghost, but they claim they heard plenty. I immediately picked a pistol up and I jumped to my feet. It was so loud. It sounded just like wooden chairs been kicked just plumb across the floor. There wasn't a chair moved. All the chairs were right in place. There was nothing turned over anywhere. This thing, whatever it is, it was almost as if uh, it would not let you rest. It was almost as if they wanted to keep you awake all night. Just about the time you would doze off. Johnny. It said, Johnny. And I looked around. My room was ice cold. Cold chills running down me. <laughs> and I was just shivering under the sheets, you know, looking around, you know, thinking to myself, man. Another night, Bobby woke up sensing someone next to him. I don't know, it was probably 2, 3 o'clock in the morning. The side of my bed just smashed 
plumb down. I mean, really went down like someone had stepped on the side of it with their foot or sat on the side of it, which really scared me because he had never done it before. Mike Richards had a similar experience, equally as disturbing. Approximately three or four o'clock in the morning, my right knee, it woke me up. I mean, it was, it was pain like I've never felt before. It was actually like somebody was sitting on my knee. I went to roll off the bed, but my right leg stayed in the same position it was. And I looked, and I couldn't see nobody sitting on it because, you know, you can't roll off, off the bed, you know, because somebody's got you pinned down. You know, so all, all I could do was, you know, hey, I raised my other leg up and started waving it across my leg, you know, like, you know, get off, whatever it is, you know. It stopped, and I could get off of bed, you know, and the minute I got up and, and walked around, it, it felt fine. You let me know, okay? Okay. Finally, some relatives of the men paid a visit to check out the hauntings for themselves. I guess, I don't know what I really expected. I guess I expected to just hear a little bump and, and that there'd be some logical explanation for it. But what I heard that night, no man or animal could have made. Before we went to bed, Susie and I decided that if I heard something, I was to nudge her. And if she heard something, she was going to nudge me. Well, we were nudging each other pretty quick. Kelly, yeah, did you hear that? Yeah. It's, it sounds like something on the ceiling is walking. Oh, oh my God. It's like it's right right above us. It sounds like it's going to. Oh, oh, oh. It's going through the wall. It's going through the wall. Oh, it's going through the wall. It's going This went on for hours. We heard whistling that was um, started off very faint, grew to very, very loud, then bam, 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 banging in the walls like something caught up in the walls. I mean, I thought the ceilings were going to cave in. It was so loud. That night, I didn't hear anything, but there was no doubt by the expression on their face. They had definitely been put through something, you know, that night. And they just said, it's time to go. I said, well, you want me to cook breakfast? Sir? No, it's time to go. Let's go, you know. <laughs> we, we was out of here pretty quick. To find out what might be happening at the ranch house, we brought in noted parapsychologist, Dr. William Rowe. He and his assistant set up video cameras and monitoring devices used to measure sudden temperature changes, traces of radioactivity, and changes in the electromagnetic fields in the area. First of all, we recorded a, n a number of uh, sonic effects from bangs to booms to uh, milder sounds. Um, the most striking of these uh, was associated with uh, a sudden increase in uh, the magnetic fields uh, in the house. Dr. Rowe believes the noises came from a physical phenomenon called the Peltier effect. He says this can occur when water seeps between the underground slabs of limestone the resulting reaction not only produces real noises, but also creates an electromagnetic field that may affect human brains, making people imagine all kinds of things. These magnetic fields affect the human brain because the human brain is a conductor. And this electric current produces striking psychological experiences that only happen in the mind. A trick of the mind? Not to those who've heard it. All I can say is come on over and we'll fix you up. Uh, it won't take long. We'll make a believer of you. Next, A.J. Bro was a popular family man who no one ever thought would leave his hometown. But he did and was never seen again. Homa, Louisiana, population 31,000. A.J. Bro had lived in Homa his entire life, raised three daughters, and worked in the same clothing store for more than 30 years. My dad came off as being very friendly. He was extremely nice. Anybody and everybody that knew him knew that if they needed something, that he was there to help them. Four years, A.J. had battled a drinking problem, which led to an arrest for drunk driving. But A.J. seemed to have conquered his demons and had been sober for eight years. 
We'd like to take care of the food. Almost every evening, he could be found at the Easy Does It Club, a support group for people with drinking problems. AJ prided himself on being available at any hour of the day or night to assist those in need. Once he got involved with the program, it changed his whole life. He became even more responsible and more dependable and more trustworthy and more of a friend because he was involved with more people. The close ties AJ had to his community made it seem impossible that he would just suddenly disappear. One night around 8.15 p.m., A.J. was seen leaving the Easy Desert Club. Hello, A.J., how you doing? Oh, fine. A half hour later, he stopped at a convenience store to buy a quart of milk. He told the cashier that he was on his way home, where he lived with one of his daughters. He never got there. Oh, okay, I'll see you later. Two days later, A.J.'s car was found abandoned in a park across the street from the club. Y'all sure this is your father's car? This is it. I immediately thought foul play because it just wouldn't be like him to park his car where everybody could find it and everybody knows him and disappear. But there were no signs of foul play. The only clues were AJ's wallet and checkbook, which were found tucked under the front seat of his car. The entire town was mystified. What happened to A.J. Bro? Soon, a number of witnesses came forward. They all claimed to have seen A.J. after he disappeared. On the same day that A.J.'s car was found, a local resident, Kenneth Pellegrin, says that he ran into A.J. outside a convenience store in Homa. Hey, A.J., how's it going? OK. It was a strange situation for me to see him then, because he just didn't look the same as he always did. He was wearing like a flannel shirt, something like a lumberjack style. And the pants were loose fitting, brown, very loose fitting. It wasn't nothing neat. And he was wearing some old tennis shoes. So that struck me as wrong because of all the times I've known him since seven years old, I've never seen him with his hair out of place or not dressed up neat. AJ was nervous. So it was like he was being watched. Kenneth Pellegrin also saw a red compact car parked in front. I noticed the car, and they had three guys still sitting in it. But then the engine was running, and he was on the phone looking towards their way. And when I came back out, AJ was gone, the car was gone. Had I known he had been missing, uh, he would have been found then, because I knew who he was. Soon after Ken Pellegrin called the office, I received another call from a witness who said that he saw AJ in a car with three other gentlemen. It was a red, uh, small, compact car uh, on a rural route about eight miles out of town. Um, he waved to A.J. Bro, but A.J. Bro did not wave back, and it's very uncharacteristic of A.J. not to wave back. He didn't think of anything of it because he didn't know A.J. was missing. It makes me think that Definitely somebody knows something. If both of these gentlemen who know him from a good while back, one a lot longer than the other, have seen him, we know that they know what he looks like, and they both saw him in the same color car with three men in it, I'm, I'm pretty much convinced that somebody somewhere knows something. Then, two weeks later, a chilling handwritten note came into the police station. It read, A.J. Bro. He was drunk at the time. Self-inflicted gunshot wound, stomach, drawstring, cotton sack, put in by friend, rolled over steep grassy bayou bank, near Dan. The note was signed, Helene. It just so happens where we found a car that, uh, that described that area. So we called the sheriff's office, water patrol units in, and they dredged uh, both sides of the dam on three different occasions, but weren't able to find anything. Four weeks after AJ disappeared, a woman named Christy Boudreau was sitting on the front porch of her house in Lockport, Louisiana. I saw a van pass up and down the street two times, so I figured whoever was in the van was evidently lost. Then I saw him reach over the driver's seat into the middle of the van, and he picked up a bag. I didn't know what was in it till he got to my porch. And as he walked to me, he looked really nervous. 
and he was shaking. Uh, would you, uh, like he wanted to know if I wanted to buy some frozen fish, and I told him no, and I smelled the alcohol on his breath, and he looked homeless, kind of straggly. Okay, thanks anyway. And as he got, I'd say, 10 feet from me, he turned around and glanced at me. And that's when it hit me that I saw that man on a missing person flyer in the post office. I have a picture here I'd like you to look of A.J. Burrell. This picture First, he looked through photographs of A.J. Older, at the police station. But he was skinnier. I was like almost certain picture. that that was the man that had approached me while I was on my porch. And that's what I told the detective, that I was 99.9% .9 sure that that was Mr. Bro. A.J. Bro uh, is a recovering alcoholic. And if he did start drinking again, and there's all sorts of things that could have happened. He could have had a blackout uh, and not remember who he is. AJ's family refuses to believe that he has turned to alcohol once again or that he disappeared by choice. Because AJ's wallet and checkbook were found in his car, they're convinced that he was abducted. When I think back to the fact that his car was found at the park, I'm wondering if he may have seen something or heard something that he wasn't supposed to see or hear. What really happened to A.J. Bro? Was he kidnapped? Was it a blackout? Or was it something else? Police now think the handwritten note about A.J. shooting himself was just a prank. A.J. Bro at this time is still listed as a missing person. We have no evidence of foul play. Uh, but of course, we have no evidence that he just got up and left either. So we really don't know what happened to A.J. A.J. Bro is 5 feet 11 inches tall and weighs approximately 155 pounds. He has brown eyes and brown hair. If you have any information on A.J. Bro or any of the other cases we've presented, log on to unsolved.com.